This week, I'm here with a lovely and talented and brilliant Jenna Pacelli, um, who I discovered through the, the magic of the Instagram algorithm is what gave me your content. And I started watching what you have to offer there and also followed you on Substack and have been reading your articles about everything related to childhood trauma and working through that somatically and uh, so many other things. I don't want to kind of understate what it is that you're doing with my summary. Yeah. So I just yeah. thought maybe you could introduce yourself and, and tell people yeah. who you are and uh, what you're about and also a little bit of your story of how you came to do this kind of work. Cause I know it was yeah. a winding road for you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Winding road is a good way. <laughs> Putting yeah. it for sure. A winding wilderness road. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've been down many winding, yes. um, <laughs> muddy, <laughs> snowy, icy wilderness roads. I yeah. On yeah. that on that note, I was a wilderness therapist. I've been in this in in the mental health industry for over thirteen years now. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am a big, I love neuroscience. I love all the, I love bringing the science into everything that we're talking about. Um, like I read white papers for fun, you know, that kind of, <laughs> like yeah. that kind of, like that kind of person. I um, have a lot of training in both shock and developmental trauma, which we'll mm. be happy to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I was a wilderness therapist. I was a wilderness field staff and wilderness therapy is, uh, is, in, in short, a, um, a treatment modality for at-risk youth and young adults. Mm -hmm. Um, I was out in the, out in the back country of Utah and Nevada, and also up in Oregon and, you know, doing therapy in blizzards and backpacking with the kids. And I mean, I've, I have a bunch of, I have so many like uh, pretty amazing stories. You can't really make up, um, <laughs> of things that happen out there with, with some of these kids. And so I, I got a lot of, um, a lot of experience working with the edges of the bell curve, mm -hmm. if we're going to talk about it that way. Like I, it was all these, all these kids that were kind of blowing out of traditional treatment. The at-risk at teen industry is this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I did time, time in that uh, population as well. And it was very much like, yes. that's, the, that's the parlance. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so I got a lot of experience working with those kinds of folks and those kinds of families who were in it's always a systemic issue. It's always a family systems issue. It's never just the kid, kid mm. or the kid's fault. Um, I want to really be very clear about that. And, um, but they became the identified patients and they tended to struggle a lot. And so they'd be kind of oftentimes the, the last resort for a lot of these families, these kids would have died or hurt somebody else severely had they continued going down the path they were going. Mm. And so, yeah, I got a lot of, a lot of, uh, experience working with folks that didn't want to be there, didn't want to do the therapy, didn't want to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so working with a lot of resistance on the, on, well, on the surface, what would be, we would call resistance, but underneath, you know, all these strategies have a, there's, there's wisdom in everything and all, every strategy and everybody. And so, um, yeah, I got a lot of experience doing that. And I was one of the, maybe probably the only, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember of any other somatic specialist. I was the, the only somatic trauma specialist in the country that was doing that in wilderness. And which is so weird because the whole thing about why wilderness is special is because it's embodied. It's like, you're, you're out there in nature, experiencing your physical self. And yes. so you would think there'd be a little more of that going on, but you would think, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you would think. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think that like, yeah, it's very experiential, but they're, they're still, really behind on, on, in many ways, trauma treatment. I think a lot of the, a lot of what works about wilderness is what the wilderness being out in nature does for people. I think that's yeah. a lot, that's doing a lot of the legwork and, and actually a lot of the field staff are doing a lot of the legwork, a lot of the clinical legwork mm -hmm. of being with those kids day in every single moment of every day, those kids are being observed, given feedback, supported. I mean, the, like the field, I can't stress enough the field staff, like how hard the field staff work. Mm. And in many ways, because I was a field staff and I was also a therapist and the therapists are running the whole clinical treatment plan. And um, they're only out there two days a week. And oh, so wow. I, you know, I always want to give good credit where credit is due. Like these programs would be nowhere and nothing without the field staff that work so hard tirelessly with those kids, even through the night, sometimes when kids are struggling and wow. So, yeah, wow. totally. And, and yes, and back to the somatic piece of, of, um, 
you know, this a somatic trauma resolution is, is fairly avant-garde. It's not, it, it's, it's fairly new in, in many ways. And it, it, in, in a lot of the work that I do even flies in the face of a lot of traditional trauma treatment, but I've found that the ways in which I work and the ways that the things I've been trained in actually release trauma symptoms for good because they're, we can get into animal studies and animal models and things like that. And, and Dr. Peter Levine's work, but I watched uh, your incredible video that you had posted somewhere of a polar bear being captured and tranquilized and yes. the, the way that, and, and anyone who has, I mean, I have dogs and, you know, the slightest stress to a dog, they have to shake it off. You know, they're shaking. Yeah. There's this kind of very predictable yes. reaction. So, so yeah, yes. this gets us into the kind of the $64,000 question, which is, you know, what, first of all, what, what do we mean when we talk about trauma um, and the kind of trauma that these kids were having and that how did, how is that different if at all from the trauma that someone like us might have? Um, and then somatic, the, the kind of somatic approach that you're talking about in terms of this isn't just trauma that lives in the head, it's, it lives in the body. And so mm -hmm. it has to be released through the body. Um, yeah. Can you just kind of talk about what the heck that is and what that yeah. means and, and why it yeah. works that way? I mean, huge, you know, just some light topics to touch on. <laughs> <laughs> just some, some quick neuroscience yeah, just, here. Just briefly. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think if we go with our animal, our animals here, I think that's a good place to start. Um, mm -hmm. There are predictable nervous system cycles of um, distress and regulation that every mammal has access to and even some reptiles. So um, mm -hmm. Dr. Peter Levine is the founder of Somatic Experiencing. He has two PhDs. One is in medical biophysics or something at Cal from Cal. And then he did a, a psychology PhD. And um, his, his work was really interesting in terms of what, studying animals and the ways in which animals, d wild animals don't walk around with trauma symptoms. Wild animals don't walk around with PTSD. Mm -hmm domesticated animals do mm -hmm. so we could talk about that and human influence on them but oh interesting um, that's a big yeah. that's a whole that's a whole podcast in itself actually totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah yes and then humans humans because we have these big neocortices cort cort that are overriding this is the, the the big part this is the important part which is um these big neocortices are these big you know cognitive brains that are overriding the limbic system so trauma is happening well, neuroscience is sort of moving away from this one brain, with this one part of your brain does this only this one thing. You know, we're we're learning that there's more of a neural network that's happening where there's multiple brain areas that are contributing to various, you know, even just to have an emotion, it like requires your whole brain. Mm -hmm. However, if we speak from a trauma perspective, there are certain brain areas that are much more involved in storing trauma, memory, um, the way that memory is laid down in trauma is very different from a regular memory, um, which is, again, it could be a whole nother podcast as well, but the way in, essentially like trauma is anything that overwhelms the brain and body's ability to stay present mm. Mm. and in the body. Okay. And so, so that, so anything, so that could be shock trauma, which is what we used to think of as our reg, like what people used to think of as you know, war trauma. Um, right. Like the thing that gives you the PTSD flashback, the, that's like, right. something that is basically harm to life or limb. That's right. That's yeah. right. Exactly. And so, so you've got shock trauma and then you've got developmental trauma and shock trauma is like too much, too mm -hmm. fast, um, uh, and too soon. Hmm. Developmental trauma is too little for too long, typically. Um, okay. So we've got, so, so, and that brings us, so I, <laughs> I'm trying to, I sometimes have this like feeling of like a fire hydrant of like, I've got 40. No, I love it. I love it. It's like, like bring it all out. And then we'll just kind of pick through the rubble and find, yeah. find what makes sense. Yeah. So, so if we, if this is a model of our brain and you can look up Dan Siegel's work, Dan Siegel out of UCLA. Yeah. Dan um, Siegel's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's got this brain model. I want to give him, you know, credit where credit is due as well. And you know, this is our limbic system and our brain stem is down and our nervous system is down in our bodies. This is all part of our brain. Limbic system, amygdala, fight, flight, freeze responses, neocortex, neocortex um, you know, which is holding the whole system together. And so our brain evolved over time um, up from the bottom up. And so trauma responses are happening in these deeper parts of the brain 
not in the neocortex. It's not happening in our thoughts. Mm. Um, we know that in trauma treatment, uh, you know, cognitive trauma treatment is just proven to just be really mediocre, just mediocre. Like the, yeah. the, the research on, on CBT for trauma recovery is, is kind of, it, it, there, it, there's not, um, there's not a lot of great evidence. It's not, it didn't really help a whole lot. And so, um, when we, we have to understand that, that there, there are going to be defensive responses, predictable defensive responses that an animal's nervous system goes through. And again, I use animal because your dogs do it. Our cats do it. Polar bears do it. Possums do it. And those processes being interrupted is actually what, in many ways, what causes the trauma symptoms. Mm. So if you go to my website on the trauma page, that first, the, the video that you saw, which is about the polar bear, the polar bear is being, is going through a flight response. He's being chased by, he's being followed by National Geographic. Being run down running. and and feels like yeah. he's going to die. Yeah. 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 And they're following him. And so he goes into a flight response. Yeah. He's also orienting, which is a normal uh, mm -hmm. part of our physiology to, to a, for threat assessment. So he's orienting, he's trying to figure out what this is. He doesn't know what a helicopter is. They're coming after him because they're trying to study him and he's not harmed right. in the process. Right. But he but thinks he's looking, he thinks he's in danger. Yeah. yeah, he thinks he's in danger. And he's yeah. his his brain doesn't know the difference. Right. Then they tranquilize him, which is a which is a chemical freeze response. So they're overriding his natural fight flight responses. Mm -hmm. They study him, do the thing they need to do. Then he starts to come out of it. He releases the defensive responses naturally. And then he sleeps it off and he goes about his day. Humans don't do this. We are constantly overriding our natural defensive responses. And my, in my clinical experience, the, the goal of trauma treatment is not to then continue to override, not to continue right. to, there's a lot of treatment out there that show that, that talks about, oh, we want the, the fear, the fear centers to actually reduce. We want, we want those, those fear centers in the brain to, to be less active. That's not actually always helpful. Like I've seen traditional trauma treatment actually really harm people again, because I've worked with these edges of the bell curve. So frequently I get the people that are washing out of trauma treatment a lot. And they're mm -hmm. like, I'm not like things like EMDR, brain spotting, um, CBT, DBT. Um, and so I see the, like the, 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 you know, and maybe my sample is skewed in that way, but mm -hmm. like, um, the, you know, if we have to kind of question, is it actually, do we actually want the fear centers of the brain to, to reduce or to, to, to be less active, mm -hmm. or are we actually looking for them to, to perhaps be a little more active while the person releases the trauma symptoms, not just override and desensitize. Is this making sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. Okay. I mean, the, the, I think I think almost every modality that you've you've listed most of them, but it's uh, yeah, it's about kind of deactivating the fear response or yeah. or um, intellectually overriding it or right. having some kind of substitute coping mechanism. And of course, yeah, you're not you're not addressing this lack of this compensatory behavior that this, this re-regulation that the dog is doing when it shakes or, um, uh, or that the polar bear is doing when it wakes up from, from being tranquilized. So yeah, there's just so, there's so much, I mean, there's, you've said such big things. And so I sort of, I want to spotlight them a little bit yes. so that the trauma, it, the, the definite, your definition of trauma is basically anything that's taking you out of the present moment. That's taking you out of, out of your body. Did I hear that right? Or is that, is that a precise? Um, yeah. Can I add to that? Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. It's, it's anything that overrides the nervous system's capacity to stay present. So, so, okay. and then, so it's the, it's the, the for somebody leaving, every person's got a different window of tolerance or window of resilience. Yeah. And depending on their childhood trauma, it's going to tell you how resilient, you know, the amount of childhood trauma is very, definitely going to determine how resilient the person is in adulthood. And we have tons of research behind this, the adverse childhood experiences scale and um, you know, they interviewed thousands of people and, um, that, that the, the, the window of tolerance is really, is really critical and people can get into a minor fender bender, but if they've got unhealed childhood trauma, they could have full-blown PTSD symptoms and seemingly out of nowhere. Mm. And that so, unhealed childhood trauma can be either the sort of acute, the, like the, the shock trauma or the developmental trauma or both. Um, oh, yes. and so the shock yes. trauma is too much, too fast developmental is too little, too long. Yes. Um, and, and so that's a, I mean, that sounds like everybody, <laughs> it sounds <laughs> yeah. like everybody's going to be walking around 
as you, as you say, with like some mix of these things to some yeah. degree with a different amount of resilience and different types of resilience, maybe for different kinds of incidents that they run into in life as well. Absolutely. So maybe the fender bender puts somebody into that kind of state for, for somebody with a, a particular mix of that childhood traumatic experience, but someone with a different little cocktail of childhood traumatic experience is fine with the fender bender, but not with a breakup or not with, you know, something, something else happening in their life. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So really the trauma is anything that overrides the person's or puts them out of their window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And then they get, they can get stuck. They get stuck like you would on the side of a river in an eddy, you know, Mm -hmm. that people get stuck in these, in these trauma responses based on how the memory is laid down Mm -hmm. um, and interrupted and all these, the way that traumatic memories are laid down is really critical in terms of how we understand what's happening in the body and the brain. So, yeah. And so that's super, that, that just super depends on who it is. And we do know that the more, if, you know, if somebody had a safe other in their childhood, somebody that looked out for them, wanted to know where they were, if they went missing, like those are really important protective factors for folks later in life. And so, um, people's attachment to their caregivers is of critical importance. I mean, it's like the most important thing and the way that our brains develop socially is through social engagement through our mirror neurons through our eyes through and through attunement from the caregiver and so if the caregivers got unhealed trauma we know for a fact that that's gonna it's gonna affect the child um, if the parent doesn't know how to manage that I mean this just leads you into so so many different scenarios where it can just be such an overwhelming amount if we're looking at the developmental trauma in particular and not the shock trauma which I think is easier to intuitively understand the the arc of shock trauma and how it might affect somebody long term and the the idea of developmental trauma I've found is a little harder for people to accept or to understand this yeah. idea that some benign neglect from caregivers, um, yeah. or you know, you're you're kind of on your own. You kind of don't have somebody that you can be fully emotionally present with. Um, all all of these things, all, all the way up to something that might create a disorganized attachment style with your caregivers a source of of love and fear. You know, that's yes. it's your safe place and your terrifying place. There's so much. You know, nobody can sit there in a in a session in therapy and start intellectually unpacking this stuff. So it has yeah. to it like. That has to be resolved in an embodied way, and uh, because yeah, you could, you're going to spend lifetimes on the couch talking about your childhood if you even remember and you remember it accurately, which we know most people don't. So where do people even begin to you know know knowing that it's living in the, the issues are in your tissues, as they say? How do people yeah. begin to even grok that and work with that and and try yeah. to begin to release it? Like there's the trauma release exercises that Peter Levine talks about. There's some sort of, I know you have some, um, kind of yoga practice on your sub stack that people can subscribe to like two minute flows to, to, you know, help, uh, regulate. Is that the best way for people to start experimenting or like where, where to begin if you're sort of like, I'm a mess and I don't know where to start. Yeah. Yes. I would. Yes. My two minute Tuesdays are, are practices that are super short that are meant to help people start to learn to find safety in their body depending on the nature of the trauma, people, some people's bodies are not at all safe. Uh, and, or with developmental trauma, this is a whole nother conversation. It with certain kinds of developmental trauma. It wasn't safe for, for people to be connected to themselves mm. based on what was happening with their, with their parent. And I've got articles on that on my Substack as well, but yeah, the two minute Tuesdays are a great way, great place to start on my Substack. And, um, you know, I think that just going back to just so people understand the importance of this that, you know, in terms of of the issues are in the tissues, which is absolutely true. We know that, and, and even in Eastern medicine, they've known this for thousands of years, which is, the, you know, and I'm going to go a little, out on a limb a little bit, but they've been saying this for a long time, which is like most disease, most disease is starting in the energy body. And I think they meant by the energy body, I think they meant the nervous system. Mm-hmm. They just didn't know what the nervous system was, right? And so um, like the the... The, the, there's two different kinds of memory that we have to understand here. One is it, implicit and one is explicit memory. Implicit is like riding a bike. It's, mm-hmm. it's the memory, it's muscle memory, muscle which is memory. actually just nervous system memory because your muscles aren't actually that intelligent. They're just doing what your nervous system is telling them to do. Mm-hmm. 
So we can just say, you know, muscle memory is actually nervous system memory <laughs> and, and implicit memory is what we have going on before we can start to, before we start to form autobiographical memory. Hmm. So, you know, kids don't remember things usually before age four, depending on the kid, you know, mm -hmm. three, maybe, but you know, there's all this, not this, these few years before we even have language yeah. on board that, or autobiographical memory that you've got a whole very, you got very formative years that kids are forming memories, uh, but they're implicit memory, including mm -hmm. in utero. And we know also through research that, that um, intergenerational trauma it goes at, back at least three generations we know this through holocaust survivors and and we've in our somatic world we actually there's we've got an estimate of maybe even seven generations back um i like to say that we're like little potatoes in our parents soup both <laughs> <Yeah>. physiologically <laughs> and yeah. you know like like our nervous systems are taking on the stress of the mother in utero yeah for but sure children can yeah. feel it they're little sponges and yeah. and it's so it's going into their nervous systems um we know that children it, it, um fetuses will clamp down on the umbilical cord mm. when a mother's using toxic substances mm. so mm. and here's our here's our first developmental double bind if that's happening right if like i need nourishment but i've got to i've got to siphon off nourishment mm. because what's coming from mom is toxic like toxic whether it's emotional nourishment. physical yes i feel like that's a, so, that's the name of a book that needs to be written is <laughs> <laughs> toxic nourishment <laughs> be a bestseller yeah um but, but yeah. That, so the double bind starts like yeah. before you're even in the world because you're yes. and the double bind being this kind of like you know i have to choose choose attach attachment to the thing that is the source of life and sustenance um That's versus right. versus you know being in in my in myself essentially yes, yes. Yeah. yes. And taking in the nourishment from her and yeah. if she's using drugs smoking cigarettes drinking alcohol whatever yeah. You don't have an option. You're stuck no. with that. And then that, yeah. that persists, of course, into childhood when there's all kinds of other things going on. And that's still, that's the only game yes. in town that you've got. And without that, you're annihilated. And so that's yes. the, the whole logic of all the attachment theory literature, but, but also yes. the, these, these types of developmental trauma that you're talking about. I remember yeah. reading in um, Gabor Mate's, um, I think, I think it was in the realm of hunger ghosts mm -hmm. when he's talking about if your ca caregiver is high when you're a child, um, or very, very small, maybe in this kind of implicit memory yes. time and, yes. you know, their pupils are dilating the, the wrong way or the kind of these, these little, there are little physical cues in addition to the emotional yes. interactions that you're having with them that are affecting neural development and, and, and affecting all of these ways that you are navigating that double bind. And that is, as you're describing, sort of getting laid down in these embodied pathways that, that really can't be accessed through talk therapy or, okay. you know, other, other kinds of EMDR, et cetera. So totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, an EMDR is touted as a somatic uh, right. approach even. And, you know, I think this is problematic because there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence of, of, of EMDR, um, releasing defensive responses mm. from the body in this way that we want to see like, like the polar bear, because what we see is that people resolve their trauma symptoms years down the road when those responses are released from the body and actively completed, that's the mm -hmm. critical part. This is, and this is also polyvagal theory, right? We, we cannot come out of fight, flight, and freeze without deactivating the freeze response. You can't, you can't really pass go and collect $200 mm -hmm. <laughs> coming out, you know, like coming out of, of, you don't get to just come out of freeze and straight into ventral vagal social engagement. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. And, and people want to just skip over a bunch of this stuff and they want these band-aid treatments and it doesn't really it's not how it goes you actually have to do the work to learn to be in your body work through the obstacles that are in the way of you wanting to be in your body which t t typically tends to do with developmental trauma um and then we're in business mm -hmm. you know? and it's because of the, the implicit versus explicit memory and implicit memory is so much of our of again of our trauma is laid down in the implicit memory even in a car accident in, our, in adulthood mm -hmm. you know pe people remember i can tell by the way somebody's moving on screen with me they haven't even said it yet and i can tell which way the car was coming mm -hmm. at them mm -hmm. because of just little little things that they're doing and they're you know or they're not wanting to look at it or mm -hmm. there's all these things that the body is doing it's remembering and it's going through a sequence when you really know how to do this work 
with folks, it's the body, you'll see the body is going to go through a sequence of, it's going to go through the event again. And it's going yeah. to continue to repeat that event until it's released in a in an effective way, not just overridden through the neocortex by by clamping down on the neocortex and getting the neocortex to stay online. That's great. So, you know, like keep keeping people regulated is great and fine for a coping skill, but we have to understand that that's not actually treatment. A coping skill is not treatment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's Band-Aid. a band-aid for right now. And that's yeah. fine. I'm not saying don't do your coping skills. No, you probably need some band-aids to function. Totally. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But I was the person who was like, I had to do an hour of yoga and an hour of meditation every single day to like sort of feel okay. I was it's like, like well, <laughs> put, put your pants on in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I can't brush my teeth without. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a super important distinction for people to understand is what are you actually doing? Because I get a lot, again, I get a lot of folks who've been, who've done EMDR mm-hmm. um, and, they, and then their symptoms come back. So yeah, people usually feel like it works. You know, I hear, yes. I hear from a lot of people that they, that's kind of the golden ticket for them. Um, yes. uh, that that's, that was a big deal, but it does tend to, yeah, we're back at square one and not too much time. But I mean, that's yeah. when you're talking about chronic developmental trauma, that is, you know, this is age sub zero throughout your entire developmental experience. Like how, how are you doing somatic work in a way that gets through it and clears it? Like, it's not, you're not yeah. reliving the experience of the car coming at you. It's not, it's not like a shock trauma event where you really can, there's this discrete kind of experience that you had a defensive strategy against. And now we're clear and you, you can yeah. know that and feel it when it's every single day yes. of your life for 18 years, yes. that, then what is, is, is that even possible for people to resolve that? And what does that look like? Yeah, yes. So it's a great question. So, you know, shock trauma treatment is going to be different than developmental tra- trauma treatment. Somewhat. I'm always weaving the somatic embodiment work throughout because, again, going back to our implicit memory, we have to have that on board. Mm-hmm. Usually, what people need to figure out is what was what did my childhood do to disconnect me from myself? Mm-hmm. Most people's issues are coming from, especially, and, and developmental trauma creates a unique uh, blend of shame. Mm-hmm. And people walk around with, with shame because if a parent is misattuned, they are not, the, the child makes that mean I'm not good enough. Mommy can't pay attention to me because I must be bad or there's chaos in my environment. So therefore I, it must be my fault. And this is, this is because depending on the development of the child, um, if we look at infants before a certain age, if you, if there's a loud noise in the environment, a young infant is just going to burst into tears. It's just going to start to wail, right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't look around, right? If you've ever been with a really yeah. young baby, it doesn't look yeah. around as like, where'd that come from? Because my, if I'm an, a young infant, my, my consciousness is everywhere yeah. because through, through social engagement, Dan Siegel's work, we know that that, that feedback into the child's brain is what starts to help them d- develop a sense of this is where my body ends and the mm-hmm. world begins. Mm-hmm. So when a young infant doesn't orient, again, there's our, our first offensive response typically is orientation to a dangerous stimulus. Mm. So a, a young, so as the child develops, you'll notice if, if development is going according to plan that they will then orient and say, and, and then, and they're not just, they're not as distressed. It's not, oh, I'm, I'm the problem. Uh. The young infant makes it mean there's a, there's a loud noise because my consciousness is, is sort of fused with everything still in the environment. They think it's them. I see. I see. So it's sort of, sort of the, yeah. it's, it's when things go sideways and haywire that we're in that kind of super reactive mode that it's, it, it, it must be me. And there's no good explanation for why this is happening the way, the way it's happening. Yeah. yeah. And if a parent, yeah. let's say, let's move it out to, to the parent, parent child relationship. If the parent cannot take accountability for their own moods, their mm-hmm. own emotions, their own unprocessed trauma, the child takes that in and makes it mean I'm bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so this is the, this is the critical sort of moment where shame 
build is created of I'm bad. Shame is I am bad. There's something wrong with me. Right. And this is the beginning of beginning of the end, so to speak. I mean, right, like right. where, you know, like well, this is where, you know, yeah. things like addictive strategies start to come in exactly. and other way, like, how can I not, I, I, I can't, I, that's, that's horrible. What's happening there is horrible. And yeah. also feeling like I'm horrible is horrible. <laughs> and yeah. so how can I live in an environment that feels horrible, but not also feel like I'm horrible all the time? Maybe I'll start eating or maybe I'll start doing drugs or maybe I'll start spending all my time scrolling Instagram and, and, yeah. and finding uh, wonderful people like you, <laughs> but it's, it's yeah. like yeah. that, that yeah. kind of escapism that comes in is, is I, yeah. it has to be emergent from this kind of intolerable, it's, it's intolerable every direction you look. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's, and it's in many ways, those strategies are, those are strategies of, of regulation. Yeah. The person is trying to regulate their, their nervous system. And so when you have this, what we call a cycle of misattunement, I've got an article on this as well. Cycle of misattunement is, is going to create this, this place in this person where they don't actually ever learn to regulate their nervous system. Right, right. Because they're no, looking but, externally for something just to basically calm it down or to, to calm themselves down. Yeah, because yeah. the parent is not tuning into them in a healthy, effective way yeah. to help them. You know, ideally the child, let's say the first example of this is like, oh, I, I, I'm I, feeling uncomfortable and I don't know what that is. Okay, mom or whoever, I just use mom ubiquitously. The caregiver comes in and and changes my diaper. Oh, that didn't, no, my diaper's fine. Oh, actually I'm hungry. Now I get the feedback. I got a bottle and now I'm getting the feedback that that sensation means hunger. Mm. So, or, or, oh, oh, that kind of uncomfortable feeling in my pants is, is, is a, is a dirty diaper. Eventually I'm right. going to look, that means I got to go potty. Right, right. So even just these super simple, like taking care of a child, if that, if those things aren't happening right away, or that's not being resolved, mm. Your child is learning, like my body is distressing, so I'm going to leave myself. The mm -hmm. only response a, ch a baby has is a freeze response mm -hmm. and dissociation, but the babies dissociate inward. So we've got this really big problem then of dissociation and people can't, can't be, there's a lot of, of, you know, mental health diagnoses that are just chronic dissociation. Mm. And so again, here we go back to our definition of trauma. One of the definitions, which is like, it's not, it's overriding my, my nervous system's capacity. And so I, you know, again, I'm, then I'm, my body becomes unsafe. I don't learn to interocept. Interoception is a critical component of trauma treatment, which is, can I track sensation internally? Mm. And, and, meaning, and meaning, meaning, meaning like, oh, again, like, oh, that, that sensation means hunger. Or okay. when I have this feeling in my chest, that actually means sadness. Yeah. Grow and develop. Right. And so we start to see this kind of phobia of the body. Yeah. Right. At, that makes perfect sense. Also, if I'm having to manage mom's moods, if we're talking about, you know, what I like to talk about typically, which is maternal narcissism. Yeah. Like I'm having to manage mom's moods because she's out of control. Now I have to abandon myself and I'm so tuned into her. I never actually develop a sense of self. Yeah. Yeah. So, and she's so, she's just so out of herself that yeah. I think you were the first person I saw, um, mentioned there, there was sort of this, uh, it, it feels icky. It feels icky to receive care from somebody who is not in their body. Um, yeah. and so putting the child again in that position of you're my only source of love and affection and safety, but it feels icky. It feels scary. Um, yes. and, and so now everybody's out of their body. So this is how it happens. Seven generations down is it's not, there's not sort of some sort of special DNA sauce. There's, <laughs> there's behavior that is, is, yes. is kind of cueing these, the suppression of the defensive strategies and the, the, uh, generation of dysfunctional defensive strategies and, and adaptations. And, um, you said in one of your sub stacks, something about, uh, children are incredibly resilient. It just comes at great cost to them. Yes. Um, you know, they're the incredible little resilient adap adaptive creatures, but at great cost. And that's, yes. that's the missing piece is yes. like, it's, there's, there is a cost to these things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's different from resilient. You know, people think that, oh, kids are resilient. No, kids are adaptive. 
Right, right. You know, you don't ever underestimate a child's need to attach to you. If they're the, your caregiver, there's a great book on this, an old school psychology, it's not super well known called The Drama of the Gifted Child. Oh, Alice Miller, beautiful book. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. what? how is the parent objectifying the child for their own needs? Yeah. And parents, parents love to, oh, my child's smiling at me. Uh, I don't want to diminish that. <laughs> but mm. there's a biological reason that they're cute. And mm-hmm. they smell good. Yeah. They've got just the right cocktail of hormones that make yeah. you attach to them because they, they're waking you up all night. They better be freaking cute. Yeah. <laughs> you know? definitely. Like I know a lot of parents who are like, thank God they're cute. Right. Yeah. Like there's a, there is an attachment need that is biologically hard drive, hardwired into mm-hmm. the system that we cannot ignore. Um, and so a lot of time, you know, again, parents, if parents are not aware of these things, they're, they tend to objectify and, and use their child unconsciously for their own needs, their own unmet needs, their own unmet trauma, their own unhealed shit. And they're doing that in a way that looks yeah. culturally like love in a lot of, in a lot yes. of ways. And that's the missing piece that these parents yes. don't think they were abusive parents. They don't think they were emotionally right. immature, dismissive parents. They think they did their best and that they love their kids and I provided you with a safe home and food on the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But these, these like much more subtle things that you're talking about of essentially yeah. using the child to, to meet those needs and, and the things that Alice Miller talks about, which is that's, that's getting into terrain that we don't tend to think about as trauma. It's, it's just, well, it's, you know, it's hard being a parent. It's, you you know, it's hard and you're going to, you're going to sort of capture those smiles and that affection from that kid and use them to try to regulate your own moods in, in ways that probably most parents do all the time. And it looks like love. It looks like a healthy family. Totally. Exactly. And, and, you know, there's a balance. This is also another core tenant of developmental trauma, which is every person needs a balance of, on the one hand, attunement and connection, and on the other hand, differentiation and individuation. Mm. So you start to see, especially with, um, you know, the personality disorders and, 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 you know, these kind of relational disorders, disorders, I don't like even like to put disorders on them, right. but yeah. that's the language you use, you know, these issues that show up relationally, it's like, um, it, there's something that goes awry with the balance between connection and attunement start to see where parents can and parenting styles and attachment styles like this is where these things go awry and so to go all the way back to your initial question which is how do you start to heal these things Mm. um one is you know as much as you can learn to get in your body Mm. and that doesn't again there's a lot of things out there that are like this is embodiment this is embodiment but they're actually overrides right that's a huge huge point yeah they're almost all overrides overrides. yeah yes they're almost all overrides except for moving your attention throughout the body mm-hmm. and tracking yourself and not interfering. But one of my, one of the, the telltale signs of, you know, I know somebody's going to progress well is are they able to stay with their internal experience without needing to change it? That's when somebody becomes, dare I say, you know, trauma proof. Yeah. Yeah. That it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's okay to be uncomfortable because I've got the capacity. Most people come into this work without enough capacity in their nervous system. Their window of resilience or tolerance is very narrow. Mm -hmm. So they're easily stressed. They're easily um, thrown into a fight, flight, freeze response. And then they go towards what you were talking about, which is all the strategies we use to clamp down on that. And every time you do that, in some ways, you're depending on the practice or the, the behavior, you're limiting your capacity. Like even breathwork stuff. Breathwork is a great example of a biohacking override. Mm. We know that that trauma lives in the diaphragm, and you can I can tell a lot about the trauma and how how the, somebody's nervous system state by the way their diaphragm is moving. That was one of my first when I when I started to become somatically aware, which I was so so disembodied, so dissociated. Yes. Um, but the the first thing was um, someone I was dating in a stressful conversation pointed out that I was holding my breath. Yes. I was like, I am, I'm not holding my breath. And then, oh shit, I am holding my breath. And then I start to notice yeah. I hold my breath a lot when I'm feeling stressed mm. and triggered. And that that was kind of the gateway into, 
what else is going? Like, what else am I doing in these kinds of moments? And you get curious about it. And I'm a big fan of um, a radical honesty practice to kind of like Mm. accelerate, (laughs) like using, using, if you're going to have a difficult conversation with someone and you can, you can do that mindfully and be aware and use narrating what's going on with you physically as part of that communication strategy. So I'm really scared to tell you this thing. And I'm noticing that my stomach is clenching while I, you know, et cetera, et cetera, for somebody who has no idea what's going on in a sensational yes. way. That is for me, a real, that was a great entry point. Um, yes. and it's, it's baby steps, but you got to start somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, and again, I'll just like you, I'll be the first to say I was dissociated for most of my life, like in mm-hmm. and out of dissociation and, freeze responses and shame responses and my body would just shut down and um, coming into this work my first foray into this work was was um, yoga actually and Mm -hmm. um, yoga not just vinyasa like kind of hard driving yoga but yoga with what we call pandicular movement which is if you imagine like when a cat or a dog wakes up from a nap and they're like Right, uh, you know, they do this big, st- super slow stretch. It's like this big exploration of the, but subtle exploration, exploration of the body. That kind of movement is a great way mm. to start to, and that's why what I teach in my in my um, uh, trauma informed yoga membership, and, and in all my groups, all my groups, I I'm in, including a trauma informed yoga component, and I notice mm-hmm. that the folks who tend to come in the numbest are like, oh, so it's like the hardest mm-hmm. for them. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. they're starting oh. to feel. It's just like, oh, that, oh, that's tight. Oh my god, like they're mm-hmm. all these things they weren't aware of, or they were just right off, or. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they st- tend to start to wake up and they can tend to be the people that actually start to avoid the practice the most. Mm, yeah. So yeah, they, they want to go seek out something that is somatic, but an override a bypass. Um, and there's yes. no, there's no shortage of them out there. Um, yes. and if, if, I mean, there's, you can feel like you're doing somatic work and still bypassing in addition to bypassing in all the intellectual ways that you're bypassing and buying another self-help book. And I think right. people just stay stuck in that mode forever. Um, and yeah. wonder why, you know, they're still freaking out when life throws some things at them, um, yes. which it tends to do. So <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah exactly. You, I wanted to ask this, this kind of, this is a big question about, um, the difference between true intuition about a, a yeah. situation versus like a gut feeling that is actually a trauma response that is steering you the wrong direction. And how do you know which to trust and, What's like when your body's talking to you and it feels like you're starting just to kind of get to know those gut feelings and those internal sensations, what makes one true and what makes one sort of a false signal? This is such a big issue. It's such, it's it's such big, a big yeah, question. I, and it, I, it, it, gave yeah. me, it freaked me out a little when you to see you talk about that because I was like, oh shit, I really trust intuition, but maybe I'm being led astray. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, and I, I think my answer to that is we can't really know what our intuition is telling us until we know how to get and stay in our bodies Mm. and be able to track sensation and verbalize that sensation and then clear out the developmental trauma in the ways, the ways in which you abandon yourself. So what will happen is people will have these neural pathways of let's say insecure attachment and they get a gut fe- a gut feeling that like maybe their partners let's say cheating on them or something mm. but you, we don't actually really we don't really know because that's that could be coming from your developmental trauma right and so part of it is again can can somebody get to a place of i can be with my internal experience and like you said be radically honest mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and not have an agenda and not have, not, not, not be like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be in, in a, you know, people start to learn the language too. This is, a, this is also the problem in many ways that people are learning all this language of psychology and trauma without any somatic awareness of what that actually looks like. So they're saying I'm dissociated and I'm like, how do you know? Yeah. If you're not, what, in there, how do you know? What tells you that? 
people are saying they're dissociated all the time. You don't actually, people don't actually know that they're dissociated. If mm -hmm. you are aware that you're dissociating, you're not dissociated. Or it can happen where people have a pattern of dissociation. They get really good at interoception and watching themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they've, and, you know, let's say in the case of dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, which is a dissociative disorder of, of, of parts. And they can feel themselves, and I, because I've worked with folks of like, they can feel themselves go away, they can feel a part coming in. That's different. If somebody's got this work under their belt and they start to dissociate, they could be like, oh, I'm up in the corner of the room watching my body. Mm. And then we're like, okay, we're not, it's not, it's not as much of a problem because the consciousness is still online. Right. So right. there's a whole other rabbit hole, but like the people are coming in again with this language and they think they know what's going on but their body is saying something else. Yeah, there's there's a, um, I was so happy to find you on Instagram because sort of these, you know, nervous system experts are a dime a dozen and they are, yeah, you know, clocks that are right twice a day. <laughs> and yeah. they're giving, they're giving right. some useful advice, but, but also so much bypassing so much. And it's not even a credentialing yeah. issue because it's, it's plenty of licensed people who have the education and, uh, you know, yeah. they can be way off from some, you know, coach with amateur advice, who's actually representing a little more truth, but it's, so it's not, it's not as if you oh spend more time in school and you'll get it better. Um, yeah. It's really just this there, this is the water that people are swimming in. And so people are starting to echo that. And um, it's again, wondering why things aren't changing. Why am I still so stuck? Why can't yeah. I stop self-sabotaging myself? Why can't yes. I quit my addictions? Um, yes. Yeah. That's a great point. I think that there's a, yeah, there's a big this is why I'm always preaching like therapists and coaches need to actually be in the work. You don't get to just get to read a book and then, and then, th you know, think that that's going to cut it. Like it's experiential for a reason. You have to go do the trainings, be in the work every single week as your therapy, as your work. And like, again, people are, people are, um, they've got the, and I can tell, I can smell it on the internet. It's like the, 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 the like, and this is also why I don't go teaching a lot of the nervous system skills publicly because, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen, I see people using some of the somatic experiencing, let's say like boundary work skills, mm -hmm. like push into the wall. Right. The problem with that is you actually, ha you're actually going to associate half the, half the population people because people don't have the capacity to actually hold a boundary in their nervous system which mm -hmm. is connected to a healthy fight response. So you go in and you start telling people, here's how you hold a boundary, but they don't actually have the capacity. They haven't worked to build the capacity in their nervous system to tolerate bigger somatic states or, or nervous system states. You're, they're, they're just going to be blowing their fuses every single time. Mm. So all I teach, all I like to teach publicly really is, 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 is until I get in front of somebody and watch their body is, is here's how to start to build that capacity. Mm. So that looks like safety, safety, safety regulation, 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 finding ways in which you can help the system be 1% more settled, noticing yeah. cues of safety in your environment, you know, like this is the foundation of all of it. And it's really recreating what people didn't get in their early childhood, which is safety. Right. But not, now they're not safety through avoidance and like a, you know, a, a safe place or a, you know, trigger free zone or yeah. these, these kinds of things that it's like the flip side of the, the BS somatic work is the, well, you know, just don't, it's not even about bypassing. It's about just avoiding entirely. Um, I saw something recently that was like, yeah, just, you know, why d don't, don't, don't pick a relationship that's going to bring up bad feelings for you. You know, only, only <laughs> pick the relationship <laughs> where you feel perfect yeah. and good all the time. Yeah. And that was coming from somebody who was licensed and was, you know, I'm a trauma informed therapist. And yeah. um, it's it, the, I think that is, we call that in the plant-based world, giving people good news about their bad habits. <laughs> You're like giving them permission to just, oh, I'm no, I don't have to, I don't have to do the uncomfortable thing. There's no benefit to doing the uncomfortable thing. Um, yeah. And so yeah, I'm just going to completely avoid this. And yeah, exactly. Flush. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the avoid the avoidance is a great, a great example. One, I think one of the core of what I teach in many ways is how to be with yourself in the face of pain how yeah. to be with yourself in the face of whatever life throws you throws your way that yeah. that is resilience can you be with it and then respond appropriately 
people often have this misconception as well that like regulation of the nervous system is always being calm. Right. That's a beautiful point. Yeah. Yeah. That, that you, you have to be zenned out to be regulated. Yeah. And that's the big, that's the big misconception in spiritual communities in yoga, Mm -hmm. in religion. And, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm holier. Like, no, that is not the goal. The goal is you respond appropriately Mm -hmm. to the situation. A good example of this was a ex-partner of mine. And I lived, um, we were living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and somebody came across our front uh, porch and you had to deliberately step up onto our porch to, um, get to our front door. And, and there were some kind of, well, I'll just call them maybe shady characters that sort mm-hmm. of rode our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I saw this person go across the window and so it's scary. I, it's scary. And I, and, yeah. and sometimes he would forget to lock the front door. Mm. And so I jumped up. I had a startle response, seeing the person come towards the front door. I jump up, run to the front door, lock the front door, make sure it's locked. Yeah. That sounds very, <laughs> very normal, very healthy, <laughs> healthy, adaptive yeah. Yeah. nervous system right. response. Like, what would the polar bear do? Kind of question. Yes. Yeah, like, the polar, exactly. The polar bear what is would the polar run bear from the helicopter. Like the helicopter <laughs> is a scary yes. threat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We want the system to respond that way. By the time I came back down and sat down, my partner hadn't even because he, he, he was he hangs out in dissociation and didn't freeze. even see the movement was, of the window. And yeah, yeah. he yeah. was like, "What happened?" Yeah. That's not an adaptive nerve, but he appears calm mm. on the surface. And a lot of people are walking around dissociated and disconnected mm-hmm. from themselves, appearing calm, appearing like they have avoidant attachment, which they do. I'm not saying that they don't, but like, that's mm-hmm. definitely underlying that as far as a nervous system state, a lot of the times, and also anxiety, there's a lot of anxiety, avoidant attachment as well. But, but, you know, it's like, that was an adaptive, the two different nervous system responses, yeah. because I've done, done so much of this work, I didn't freeze. Yeah, yeah. I was present. I was like, oh, I got to respond to this <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. an that's a that's a regulated nervous system and we and we don't want to judge different nervous system states as better or worse mm-hmm. that nervous system state was probably adaptive for him growing up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. probably continues to be adaptive so there's not there's not a judgment you know that actually we free state a free state is not we're not judging a free state that could be a really adaptive response as well getting quiet getting small playing dead very adaptive sure. um you yeah. know depending on the situation as well so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and 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 one that um yeah a lot of women will do around dangerous men um in, yes. in particular yes. so. you see this a lot in domestic violence yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so yeah teasing out kind of what's adaptive what's right. what's what's a childhood attachment strategy that was adaptive at one time but no longer is adaptive i mean he just huge questions so there are 10 trillion zillion things i want to ask you but i also want to i know you've got a, a cutoff time so um you are you are starting a workshop soon for uh daughters of narcissistic mothers that's happening yeah. in addition to your other resources do you want to where's the best place for people to find that or work with you and all that jazz yeah. Yeah. So if they go to my Instagram and I'll send you the link too, for them to sign up, um, so you can put it in the show notes or whatever, but, um, the, yeah, they can sign up on, if you go to my, any of my Instagram posts and you comment workshop, we'll send you the link there. Um, my website, jennapacelli.com is a great resource. And then my Substack is jennapacelli.substack.com. You can subscribe for free, get a lot of the articles for free. Um, I've got my two minute Tuesdays there and this, the next few months, we're going to be talking about parental and maternal narcissism and the way that that shows up and affects daughters, but, and it really can apply to anybody across the gender spectrum. It just seems to be particularly insidious when it's the same gender parent, um, Mm. because they're more of a narcissistic extension. So yeah, those workshops are coming up next week and I, um, will likely continue to hold them uh, maybe a couple times a month, potentially. Um, And yeah, and I've got my uh, trauma-informed yoga and mindfulness membership, which is also a great place to start if you're wanting to. I get a lot of really good feedback about that as a component of group. Mm -hmm. Um, I run a somatic embodiment six-month group as well. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, if you comment heal on any of my Instagram posts, you'll get a link there, but that's also on my website and, and you can apply and if you're accepted, then we get on a call together and, and see if it's a good, full, good clinical fit for a group and um, go from there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, 
this this is just so great. Thank you so much for your time. And um, I, this is so much valuable information. I can't, I, I don't think I've ever packed so much into an hour before for people to, <laughs> people to uh, re-listen to and get so much out of. So yeah. thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Really great to be with you. And thank you for your time too. Awesome. All right. We'll, we'll see you next time. And hopefully we can, I can drag you back in the future to ask you more questions. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Happy to, happy to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Good night. Okay. Bye.